Welcome to Riding Shotgun with Mike Neff. Glad to have y'all join us in this evening. We got a very busy show. We have an interview with four-time national champion, Philip Morris. He's gonna call in on the hotline and give us a little insight into his 100th career win at Motor Mile Speedway. We're also gonna sit down in the hot seat with Avery Moore, the principal of Palm Charter School, whose facility is right across the street from Myrtle Beach Speedway. We're also gonna give you a little heads up about the upcoming week's race, and of course, review last week's action around the Southeast. But first, let's take a look back at the action from last weekend when the Traxxas Monster Truck Destruction Tour took to the famed half mile here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. The Circle K Traxxas Monster Truck Destruction Tour took to Myrtle Beach Speedway on Friday this past weekend for an action-packed night of exciting monster truck car crushing action. The evening started off with a pit party. The fans were juiced to be in the infield. Thanks to the folks at Circle K and Pepsi for putting on a great pit party. They then filled into the stands for a night full of monster truck and drifting action. And when it was all said and done, it was the heavy hitter who took home the hardware as a champion in the freestyle competition. They came back on Saturday night for an even bigger night of action here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. The Circle K and Pepsi folks once again put on the pit party. As part of the pit party, the folks from Beach Hobbies and RC put on the Try Me section and let people get their hands on some very cool Traxxas remote control trucks and vehicles. Once they were done with the pit party, we went back into the stands and they were brimming as the monster trucks took to the track and put on a night of amazing action. The folks from Myrtle Beach Drift were even sliding around the half mile oval, streaming smoke and sparks. It was unbelievable. And when it was all said and done, it was X-Max who took home the trophy as a champion in night two's freestyle. Thanks again to the folks from Circle K and from Pepsi and Beach RC for putting on an amazing monster truck show. Our next event at Myrtle Beach Speedway will be Walk Your Dog Night this coming Saturday. Gates open at 5, racing starts at 8. Feel free to bring your four-legged friends out and walk the track after the night is over. And if you don't have a four-legged friend but would like one, the folks from the Grand Strand Humane Society will be here with rescue animals. You may just find that furry friend to take home when the action is done. But we are going to have plenty of action on the track. We have late models, twin charger features, mini stocks, and vintage cars all tearing up the historic half mile here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. Don't you miss it. If you can't be here on Saturday night, don't forget you can follow along on local HTC Channel 4, htcconnect.com, and fanschoice.tv. You can always catch that racing action live anywhere in the world on those avenues. When we come back, we're going to have Avery Moore, the principal of Palm School, in the hot seat. Make sure you hurry right back after this brief message. This Saturday night, see the stars of tomorrow today. Grandsons of Richard Petty and Joe Gibbs compete this Saturday night, Myrtle Beach Speedway. Kids 11 and under, free. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Riding Shotgun. We got a special treat for you this week. The Palm Charter School is right across 501 from Myrtle Beach Speedway. It is a charter high school that is specifically dedicated to getting kids involved in motorsports. We're honored to have Avery Moore here, the principal from Palm School. How you doing today, Avery? I'm great. I'm, I'm at the track. You know, it's a great day to be at the track and uh, watch some of these cars go around the track. It's going to be a fun day of practice, getting ready for this weekend's racing here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. Now, you guys had a really cool event yesterday over at the school. Can you tell us a little bit about that kids camp that you had? Right. We had the first ever kids race camp uh, in South Carolina. Uh, we have a facility that houses a number of race cars, a number of projects that the kids are doing. So I decided to go ahead and, and have a, uh, a camp that would allow kids 5 through 12 come in and kind of experience what it's like to be a professional race car driver. They can, they can see how we build the cars. We got little small projects that they do there. Uh, NASCAR Racing Experience and Myrtle Beach Speedway provided free pace car rides for the kids to come over here and go around the track. So parents stay, they watch the kids. It was just a, a great day, feel good day for the kids. Absolutely, and it's a great time anytime you can get kids involved in racing. Now, speaking of building your cars over there, you've actually got a car that's out here at the track today that you're going to be shaking down that was built from the ground up over there at the school. That is correct. We have our motorsports technology teacher, Keith Farrell, uh, had a car that he built from the ground up, and the students that was the students' projects in motorsports tech class this year. So he took a, uh, took a car, the kids did everything on that car, we dropped an engine in it, did the graphics on it, and it's here today for its first run. Very cool. Now, 
along with kids that come out of your school, I know that Alex Hicks is one of our drivers that's run over here in the Charger Series. He's another student from your school. His dad works over there as well, Ray does. But he's got a car that he's also built from the ground up. I don't know how much of it was in the school, but um, can you speak a little to his journey coming to the school and now to the point that he's driving a car that he built himself with the skills he learned at your school? Well, Alex Hicks is phenomenal. Alex Hicks is really our prototype that we say that we want our kids to be when they come out of our school. He has uh, actually donated his last car uh, into our school so our kids can work on his last car. He's got a new car now and uh, he's actually also started uh, and a car from the ground up as well and been building the cage work on it. So Alex is a, one of those kids that comes back, talks to the kids, uh, is just almost like a, a veteran already at his young age and uh, we, we think our program kind of helped him move through that and get that kind of exposure so it matured him and we see him to be you know, on the speedway for a long uh, number of years here in, in, the, in the future. Yeah, I agree. I think he's got a long career ahead of him driving race cars. Uh, outside of the, the racing piece of it, just talk a little bit about becoming a charter high school that focuses on racing. How do you go about getting the state to say, okay, we can go along with this program and let you be a high school? Well, um, that journey started about five years ago, and uh, I just finished my first year as principal at the school. Um, and I, so I'm here as a kind of Johnny come lately, but what attracted me to this program, I'll tell you first, was that it's the only motorsports high school in the nation. Um, I've been in, in, in public education for 18 years, and I really got tired of the same old, same old. So when an opportunity came my way to be a part of something that was fresh, unique, one of a kind, I took it. So I came out here, and the charter was started about five years ago, and they applied for a charter. Uh, then we had to show basically what classes we were going to offer. Once we applied for the charter, the state gave us the charter. Horry County is our parent, somewhat to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so we function like in every other high school. You get exactly what you would get at every other high school, but our electives are geared just toward the motorsports industry. That is very cool. Now you talk about the, the students learning over there about working on the cars, but they also get to work over here a little bit as far as the, the backbone or the running of racetracks because we have different scenarios where we'll have kids come over on weekends to work and kind of work on electives or whatever. Can you uh, just kind of touch base on that marriage between Myrtle Beach Speedway and Palm School and how we kind of give and take back and forth? Well, we're very fortunate the NASCAR Racing Experience and Myrtle Beach Speedway has basically stepped out and uh, partnered with us to just really help us with our vision because it is a win-win situation. Uh, NASCAR really needs the new next generation of NASCAR mm -hmm. to start appearing. Otherwise, if we don't show these kids how to build the cars, uh, how to work on the cars, I mean, you know, who's going to be there for NASCAR in the next 15, 20 years? Yep. So we are glad that we have partnered up. Um, Bob Lutz and I have had several conversations on what we see uh, that relationship becoming in the next two, five, ten years. And we've actually instituted an internship for this upcoming winter so that we'll have at least two seniors that will come over here and get a certain number of hours during uh, the upcoming season to give them that exposure, give them real world exposure to what it's like to run a racetrack and be around it. That is very cool. Now one last question, how does a student go about getting into this program and into this school if they want to be a part of Palm Great School? question. I want to make sure that everybody understands this. As long as you are an Horry County resident, it's free. We, we give, um, that is th true of any charter program. So if you live in Horry County, you can come do an application, uh, fill out the paperwork, and uh, automatically become a student uh, then on the spot. Now, what if you don't live in Horry County? Do you have people interested from around the country that might come in? Well, my vision, just to be honest with you, my vision is that uh, we are in the process of starting a, a new facility uh, this September. Uh, we'll be breaking ground on a $6 million facility nice. that will let us do what we're doing um, three times as large and uh, the building itself will be one that will show, showcase the school, showcase what we're doing, so that um, other students, other um, stakeholders, or other educational leaders come in, they see what we're doing, they take our idea to Texas or Virginia and build other programs. So we're like a pilot program that I think could revolutionize public education. 
So that is a great story. We truly appreciate you being involved here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. So if you guys are out there in Horry County and you like what you see here at Myrtle Beach Speedway, or if you just want to learn something new and different as part of your high school experience, come over and pay a visit at Avery. Once again, they're right across from the Speedway, across 501, and become a part of the Palm Charter School. When we come back, we got more of Riding Shotgun. Do you have the need for speed? We put you in the driver's seat of an authentic NASCAR race car, once driven by a NASCAR star. The NASCAR racing experience is offered at Myrtle Beach Speedway. You can drive at top speed, and passing is allowed, or take the NASCAR ride along with a professional driving instructor. Make your dream a reality today and sign up for the NASCAR racing experience. Welcome back everyone to Riding Shotgun. So glad you're spending a little bit of your evening with us. We have an extra special treat this week. The uh, four-time national champion, second all-time on that list, Philip Morris has decided to join us on the phone this week. He is coming off a very historic win at Motor Mile Speedway. He scored his 100th late model victory at that historic track. How you doing today, Philip? Oh, doing a lot better after this weekend. I hear you, brother. I know you uh, went up there one week and thought you had a shot at it, but ended up coming up a little short. So it took you an extra couple weeks to finally get it. But tell us a little bit about the emotions wrapped up in a hundredth victory at Motor Mile. Uh, kind of hard to describe. I mean, it's something that we've been battling for pretty hard and working extra special through the nights. And my guys have been really uh, sweating it out trying to get this one done. And so it's really kind of hard to describe. It's not something you really set out to do, but when you get that close and you, you, you're at my age, 52, it's uh, one of them things you don't know how much longer you can race. And so, yeah, it was one of those relief moments and also uh, just, you know, it's hard to describe, just really good. Right on. Now, I know in the post-race after that win, you gave a lot of credit to the guys that work for you and work on your cars. You've been doing this since 1995. Can you even count how many guys have helped you on your cars over those 30 or so years? No, I can't. I've had some guys that have stuck it out the whole time, and they're like me. They're getting pretty old and getting tired. Uh, but, you know, it's been so many crew chiefs that I've had that have been just tremendous, and I've worked with some guys that have gone on to the cup level now. And, um, you know, and, and back, back in the day, you know, I put a lot of man hours in the cars myself. Nowadays, it's hard for me to do, so... Um, that credit I was given to those guys the other night, it was legit. I mean, those guys are doing all of it, and they're making it easy for me to, to get the victories to get us up to 100. Now, I want to touch a little base on your operation now versus a few years back. When you were making those runs for the national title, it, it was a really huge financial commitment, and it took a lot of effort to do a lot of travel around and hitting a lot of different tracks. Nowadays, it, it, you've only run nine races this year, so it's not that commitment anymore. Is it now more of a love of the sport and just having some more fun with it than it was back then chasing the title? Yeah, it's kind of hard to describe the division that I'm in until you actually get into it. But, yeah, for me now, it's, um, it's more of the enjoyment uh, of a sport um, like a lot of guys do. Um, and back in the day, it was a lot different. It was like get as many races as you can in uh, to learn from it, uh, but also to get victories so that you can compete on a bigger level, on a national level. Um, we've not shied away from races this year. We just try to be a little more selective and a little bit more precise in our setups to, to be able to compete on maybe just a higher level at the tracks that we do go to. So our win percentages are, have been more than 50% all year, and um, we're hoping to actually close in on to a better percentage as the year goes on. Cool. Now, coming kind of back around your 100th win, Lee Pulliam was in that race, giving you all he could, along with Mike Looney and a couple others. I know you and Lee have had some pretty historic battles over the year. Was it extra special getting that 100th win with him in the field? No question. I mean, uh, to have him there for that victory was better for me. A lot of people think that him and I are enemies. We're not. We're really close friends. We have a lot in common. We have kids. I mean... It's, you know, he's a family man now, so it's just the older he gets, the more him and I have in common. And uh, you, you always look for a rhyme or reason for everything that happens. And uh, I really think that it was just meant to be for him to be there, uh, not to be for bragging rights or anything like that. But, you know, for his, for his sake, one day he's going to have 100 wins, and I think he needed to see it. And 
you know, of course, we had a really good shot of getting this done two weeks ago, and he was at Myrtle Beach, and I thought in the back of my mind, you know, it, he was, it, that, that's the one thing that would be missing if he wasn't there. And for us to come out with a really fast car the other night and win both those races, and it was just a complete package. You know, it was a complete win. It was a complete victory. It was a complete success, and uh, just really hard to describe the feeling of that. Now, you did give a lot of tribute to your fans as well. You've obviously got a huge legacy in the Virginia area between having Victory Lane named after you at South Boston and now 100 wins at Motor Mile. Can you speak to the, the loyalty of those Philip Morris fans wearing the red shirts in the stands that go around to all these races to watch you run? Yeah, and I really meant that too, you know, because it's hard, you know, dry, all the drivers will understand what I'm about to say, but um, when you go to the racetrack and you see your, your jerseys up there and you see your colors being represented up there and you're not quite getting the job done on the racetrack, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to to face up to but you it's just a reality and you know you talk to your fans after the race and you say hey we're trying hard we're going to make you proud and the other night it was just great to be able to do that for them because they're the ones that's been supporting us and pushing us and uh you know defending us uh up in the grandstands everywhere we go so it was just really great to celebrate with them because they've seen what we've had to go through to get to this point cool one last question on the national points level I know you've only got nine races in and you're down somewhere in the 40s, I believe. Is that still a possibility or do you feel like it's more of a, a quality of races and just enjoying it now rather than trying to go for that national title again? Yeah, the way we've done it in the past in 06, 08, 09, and 011, we kind of just set out to see where we were. And as far as competitive wise, not so much did we win the races, but were we the best car and could we win races? Because you got to make a decision some point during the year. Um, usually by halfway is when we make that commitment if we can actually dominate where we go. And I really feel like that they've gotten a car underneath of me that, that's probably been better than any one of those four years that we won a national from. Now, obviously, you've got to have that and then some nowadays. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to making the commitment. And, of course, that means traveling a lot. a lot more um, personal time involved there. But... Uh, they can just about count me in because I'm, I'm behind it 100%, and I'd like to go for that, that fifth national. Well, that is awesome news to hear. I know your fans are excited about that. And in all honesty, in a selfish way, I'm glad to hear that too because we've got some pretty big car counts down at Myrtle Beach Speedway, and hopefully that means you'll make a trip down to the south side of uh, South Carolina and join us at some point this year. I don't think there's any doubt that we will have to make that run and we'll have to come down. Your car counts are awesome. Uh, Obviously, uh, the cars, uh, you know, Lee's doing very well down there, and we've got really similar setups and similar driving styles. You know, he's just going to be a hard guy to beat down there, as well as some other guys that are, seem like they're dominating really good. But I don't see how we could not come there if we're, if we're vying for a national championship. Uh, Myrtle Beach Speedway is significant. Right on. Well, thank you so much for being on the phone today, Philip. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you down the road down here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we got some more of Riding Shotgun coming your way. This is Mike Neff. Welcome to Daytona One Performance Lubricants and Chemicals. Hey, my name is Buck Parker, President and CEO. Let me tell you a little bit about our products. We manufacture lubricants and chemicals that make your car run better, last longer, and look better than new. Our products are proven worldwide in places like Hubble, NASA, racetracks everywhere, and in garages just like yours at home. Go to our website and check us out, www.daytona1.com. Thank you. We appreciate your business. Welcome back to Riding Shotgun, everyone. It's that time of week where we have to bust out the reading glasses because it's time to review all the racing action around the Southeast from this last weekend. First up, they were at Kingsport Speedway on Friday night. In late models, it was Cress Van Dyke taking the win. He beat Zeke Shell to the line. Robbie Ferguson was third, Wayne Hale came across the line in fourth, and Derek Lane rounded out your top five. In the modified streets, Kevin Wolf grabbed the trophy. He was ahead of Rusty, Rusty Clendenin. Paul Scholl was third, Rick Utzman fourth, and Jared Broadbent rounded out your top five. In the pure fours up at Kingsport, it was Billy Ketron beating Jason Ketron to the line. Craig Phelps was third, Le Levi Cox fourth, and William Hale rounded out your top five. In the Mod 4s, David Brown grabbed the checkered flag first ahead of Kevin Cantor. Billy Duty was third. Chris Amberge was fourth. And Herschel Robinette 
finished out your top five. They finished up the night up there with Pure Streets. Doug Austin took the win ahead of Jamie Meadows. Third place was Jay Swecker. Crossing the line fourth was Peter Alley and Bobby Talbert rounded out your top five. We head down to Pensacola, Florida for a little action at Five Flags Raceway. The Modifieds of Mayhem took the track once again. Corey Rubel grabbed the victory ahead of Bailey Curry. Joe Aramendia crossed the line in third. Zachary Knowles was fourth. And Donald Crocker came home in fifth. In the Pro Trucks, J.J. Day had another good day to take the win ahead of Clint Holmes. Jarrett Parker ended up in third. Andrew Johnson crossed the line in fourth. And Jensen Jorgensen was in the fifth spot. In the Pure Stocks, it was Jonathan Day. Good day for the days down there. David Johnson came home second. Robert Balkum was third. Tommy Blocker ended up fourth. And Kevin Merritt came home in fifth. Finally, in the Sportsman's, it was Jason Huffmaster taking a victory ahead of Jonathan Langham. Mark Barnhill was third, Steve Buttrick fourth, and Brandon Fowler rounded out your top five. The Ultimate Super Late Models had a twin weekend running at Livonia Speedway and North Georgia Speedway. First up, they were at Livonia on Friday night. Johnny Persley grabbed the win ahead of local favorite Casey Roberts. Defending champion Dennis Rambo Franklin ended up third. Tyler Millwood was fourth, and Brent Dixon came home in fifth. Over at North Georgia Speedway on Saturday, it was John Ownbay taking the win ahead of Michael Page. Jason Welshan came home third. Tyler Millwood was fourth, and David Payne ended up in fifth. Millwood is your current points leader for the Ultimate Super Late Models. Motor Mile Speedway, as you heard us on the interview earlier with Philip Morris, had twin late model features. In late model feature number one, it was Philip Morris scoring his 100th career win in a late model at that historic track. He beat Mike Looney to the line, Lee Pulliam ended up third, Ryan Repco fourth, and Kyle Grissom making a late model start came home in fifth. In late model feature number two, Philip Morris proved the 100th win was no fluke by going back to back. He bested Ryan Repco at the line, Mike Looney ended up third, Lee Pulliam fourth, and Derek Lancaster makes the appearance in the top five. In the Super Streets, Doug Williams grabs the win over Chad Connor. Scooter Hollinsworth ended up third. Matthew Gussler was fourth. And Dan Martin came home in fifth. The Modifieds also had twin features up there at Motor Mile. Chucky Williams grabbed the win in race number one ahead of Doodle Lang. Corey Dunn ended up third. Dennis Holdren made the trip over to finish in fourth. And Jesse Yop crossed the line in fifth. Mod race number two, or mod four race number two, I should say, it was Doodle Lang Rebounded from that second place in the first race to grab the win. He beat Corey Dunn to the line for the second race in a row. Haley Holdren ended up beating Dennis Holdren for third. And Jesse Yop had back-to-back -to -back top five finishes. Finally, the U-Cars wrapped it up at Motor Mile with Ryan Cox taking a win. Mike Reed ended up second. Joel McCoy was third. Butch Nolan fourth. And Jeffrey Davis came home in fifth. South Boston Speedway had a whale of an event. In the late model feature of the first race, Peyton Sellers and Bobby McCarty came to the line side by side after a late race caution saw Peyton Sellers push McCarty up the track to get the advantage. When they got to the white flag, McCarty crowded Sellers, ended up getting turned across Sellers' nose and going into the outside wall. Austin Thaxton was also caught up in the incident, which was interesting as we'll talk about in a minute from the second feature. But when it came down to the end, it was Peyton Sellers grabbing a win Ahead of Jeb Burton, Danny Willis was third, Stacy Perrier fourth, and Madeline Crane came home in fifth. In that second late model race, McCarty and Sellers ended up at the front again, and this time when, when Sellers went by McCarty, McCarty was having none of it. Bumped him twice down the backstretch, then turned him in turns three and four. Sellers ended up making his way all the way back to third, but after rebounding from the accident in the first race was Austin Thaxton, taking the win. Jeb Burton had a second, second place finish ahead of Sellers. Danny Willis came home third, and Stuart Cruz ended up in fourth. In the limited sportsman race number one, it was Colin Garrett taking that win ahead of Trey Cruz. Mike Jones ended up third, Chris Elliott fourth, and Eric Winslow rounded out your top five. Garrett made it back to back in the second limited race with another win ahead of Cruz. Eric Winslow came home third this time. Brandon Jones was fourth, and David Latour making a limited sportsman start, ended up fifth. Finally, in the pure stocks, it was Quincy Adams taking the win ahead of Randy Hupp. Johnny Lane was third, Harrison Walker fourth, 
and Jimmy Wade came home in fifth. I want to take a final mention of the Wheelin All-American National Points. They have been updated for this week. Lee Pulliam is still in that top spot and looking to see if he can win a national championship by racing all of the races here at Myrtle Beach Speedway. David Roberts is now in the 17th position. Local favorite Brian Voss is in 37th, one slot ahead of Ty Gibbs. Justin Milliken is in 48th. In 78th, it is defending track champion Matt Cox, right ahead of Jerry McDowell, who is in 79th. And Sam Yarbrough rounds out the Myrtle Beach drivers in the top 100, sitting in 81st position. So that's a quick look at what happened around the region in the southeast this past week. When we come back, we're going to give you a little bit of breakdown here on Riding Shotgun. This Saturday night, see the stars of tomorrow today. Grandsons of Richard Petty and Joe Gibbs compete. This Saturday night, Myrtle Beach Speedway. Kids 11 and under, free. Welcome back to Riding Shotgun. It's time for a little bit of breakdown. I want to expand a little bit on our discussion we had with Avery Moore from the Palm School. We're at a bit of a crossroads in NASCAR right now and in racing in general. And it's a matter of getting the youth of America and youth of the world involved in motorsports again. Kids that grow up now, millennials as they like to call them, aren't tied to cars like the older generations are. When we grew up back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you had pictures of Mopars and Fords and Chevys on your bedroom wall. Today, you just don't get kids putting posters of cars on their walls. So it's a matter of indoctrinating them and getting them in to cars and into the racing world. And that is the beauty of what Palm School is doing. They are working with high school age students and indoctrinating them and getting them ready to advance in a motorsports or an automotive career. And it is a great pipeline for what we need throughout the, the country in the racing world. They can come to Palm School, they can then go right on to the NASCAR Technical Institute, or they can go on to ARCA teams, they can go on to truck teams, they can get their feet in at the ground level and start working their way up into sport. And as they have those people involved, you also end up with their families involved. Right out here, we talked about Alex Hicks. His dad, Ray, is out here at the track all the time, helping on his car, helping with the racing and incorporating the family. That's the beauty of local short track racing is the families are always involved. And the family is involved, they end up getting their friends to come out and watch. And the next thing you know, you're building a fan base. And if we get that fan base built up at the grassroots level, then as these guys advance up the ladder, they will tag along and we will continue to grow the sport back to where we want it to be. I don't know that you're ever going to get late 90s, early 2000s growth out of the sport again. That was a boom before we had social media and mass media options for following the sport. But it can absolutely get better than it is now. And the key is getting kids involved, letting them realize what a great sport racing is, pulling the families into it, and ultimately building that pipeline back to the top levels so that we can start following the current stars that are moving in, like Chase Elliott, Daniel Hemrick, William Byron, Eric Jones, Daniel Suarez, Bubba Wallace, all of these young guys that are just now getting their feet wet and that are going to be in a sport for 10 or 15 or 20 years, along with your drivers out here that we see running at Myrtle Beach Speedway now. Guys like Ty Gibbs, Noah Gregson, Brett Moffat, those kind of guys, Thad Moffat, are going to be out here running for years to come and hopefully climbing up those ladders. So getting the kids involved like the Palm School is doing at the grassroots level and building cars from the ground up teaches them about racing, ties them in and gives them a passion for it, and ultimately can lead to a lifelong career in motorsports. So if you're looking for a way to get involved, talk to Avery Moore and the gang over at Palm School because they will absolutely get you on the right track to being part of racing. Don't forget, next week we'll be back with Riding Shotgun to recap Walk Your Dog Night, also take a look at some more racing around the Southeast, and maybe delve a little bit more into that national points hunt as we're starting to see it heat up and some of the guys that are involved in it are realizing if you're going to win a national title on asphalt, you're going to have to come through Myrtle Beach Speedway. Once again, thank you all so much for taking a little bit of your time out to spend a night with us here on Riding Shotgun. We will see you next week. I am Mike Knapp.